and welcome to Keep the Bastards Honest, the podcast of the Australian Democrats. I'm your host, Alana Mitchell, and oh boy, it's time flown. We didn't mean to release one episode and then go on a mini hiatus for the first few weeks of 2022, but Steve and I got busy with a bunch of other important projects for the party in our roles as national vice presidents. However, we're back on deck and we've got some cracking episodes to share with you. In light of the events, dear boy, events that have overtaken the world and not to make light of the terrible tragedies unfolding in Ukraine and down the flood-stricken eastern seaboard of Australia, I thought we might share with you a webinar we held in October 2021 for our members. Dr Nathan Bell joined us as a guest to discuss his book, Refugees, Towards a Politics of Responsibility. In the book, Dr. Bell argues for nothing less than a new concept of the political, that all societies embrace an ethos of responsibility for refugees as a primary duty, where the right to seek asylum becomes foundational for politics itself, rather than a secondary duty. The ongoing plight of mass displacement, which we're seeing unfolding in Ukraine, will only increase with the effects of climate change, and make such a turn in politics one of the fundamental questions of the 21st century. Before we get to the episode, I have to apologise in advance for the audio quality on this recording. Dr Bell's internet was not behaving itself when he tried to join us online for the webinar, so he had to dial in on his mobile phone and present to us that way, which resulted in less than ideal audio for him. I would definitely encourage you to persevere with listening if you can, because his presentation was quite profound and thought-provoking, and his message is well worth listening to. I'm recording this intro on the unceded lands of the Wadjuk Nation, and I pay my respects to the traditional owners of these lands and their elders past and present. Always was, and always will be, Aboriginal land. Quick intro to Nathan. He's Dr. Nathan Bell. He works as an as an academic at the University of Melbourne, if I can get my words out. And he's previously taught at Monash University. His research interests include human rights, refugee studies, uh, political theory, and philosophy. So he's very well rounded. And he's published in international journals and attended conferences both nationally and internationally in relation to his fields of studies. And um, he's going to take us through. Um, I think uh, part of his book, Refugees Toward a Politics of Responsibility, uh, tonight. And I think we have a discount code to be able to purchase that book if you, um, you want to follow up and, and read more of Nathan's research. Uh, but I'll hand over to Nathan now. And with my thanks for um, his presence tonight and, and also to his dad, David Bell, uh, who's one of our uh, fundraising members and, and was instrumental in, in getting Nathan on board to have a chat to us today. So much thanks to everybody. Please enjoy. Right. Thank you for having me. Um, it's it's a pleasure, and uh, and I'm always happy to talk about refugees with whoever will listen. Um, and it's credit indeed to the Australian Democrats that you are listening um, in what are very dark times for refugees and asylum seekers, both in this country and globally, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, and whatever we can do to sort of hold up the flickering candle in times of trouble and and build up our little light against the encroaching darkness uh, should be done. And I'm pleased that. Democrats are serious about this effort. Uh, when I say encroaching darkness, this is not hyperbole. Um, the question of the refugee is connected to perhaps the other biggest question of the century, that of climate change. And the fate of one issue is tied to that of the other. It's estimated but that by the middle of this century, that is in only 29 years, scarily enough, or nearly 28, in 2050, there could be up to 1 billion people, with a B, displaced by the effects of climate change. Uh, And one thing I hope we can get to a bit later on this evening is the problem that the Refugee Convention and most legal jurisdictions face in that they do not recognise forced migration due to climate change as counting legally as refugee status. So the Refugee uh, Convention refers to persecution, um, but it doesn't cover um, in a de jure sense um, the range of people, both from climate change and indeed from other um, Uh, issues that make people vulnerable or displaced people, uh, that's not covered in the convention. So this is uh, a sort of emerging area of scholarship where a lot of people are working on this. But there are enormous challenges, uh, both upon us right now uh, and uh, that are 
heading towards us in the future in terms of the scale, the dimensions of displacement, statelessness, people seeking asylum, refugees and mass migration. So it's of the utmost importance, as I'm sure you all know, to, uh, to sort of come to grips with this. And so, and not only the, the present and the future, but indeed the past, a, lot, uh, a significant focus of my book was on trying to draw lessons from previous episodes of mass uh, statelessness and the production of refugee populations, most especially around uh, Jewish people in the Second World War and the flight from, from Hitler and, and the Holocaust, the Shoah. So I try to run in my book, Past, Present and Future, somewhat together to see, see what lessons can be learned and how we can address the future. So I'm going to present to you this evening the broad thesis of my book, which was released earlier this year. Um, there's currently an e-book out and there's going to be a paperback um, out early next year. And I'll provide a link um, later on if you're interested. Uh, what I want to try to do tonight is present the book jargon free. That is with a kind of minimum of academic language. Try to make my case for how uh, both uh, thinking and action um, should be uh, construed in this context in relation to uh, refugees and the need for change. Um, and change is needed, not only the, the looming effects of climate change, as I mentioned, but other calamities that we are watching in the headlines right now, whether it's uh, people fleeing Afghanistan or the Haitians who are at the border in the United States, um, that sort of underlines the, the urgency of all this. And every day there are, are more stories of of woe and desperation uh, and the people trying to cross the Mediterranean uh, from Libya and so on. So there's, there's a lot going on and there's a lot that needs to be done and there's a lot of lessons that need to be learned. Um, so that's what I, what I hope to uh, work through uh, with you all this evening. And, and as was mentioned at the beginning, I'm very happy to take questions. I think it, it may be hopefully more interesting for you or more engaging for you if we have a bit of a dialogue uh, rather than me just giving uh, one long uh, verbal piece. I think it'd be sort of a nice idea to break it up and I'd be very, very uh, interested to, to take your questions and field your questions about uh, what we're talking about tonight. So uh, whenever you want, um, you, I don't know how you want to sort of uh, work it at your end, but if you want to indicate um, to to the organisers that you have a question, I'm happy to take questions at any time. So I thought I'd just begin by reading the very first uh paragraph of my book and also the epigraph. This is from the page one, the introduction. So the epigraph is from Judith Butler, who's a famous uh, theorist. She's a theorist of gender studies. She's known primarily for that, but she's also written about refugees. And this is what she says. But if we take seriously the inability to choose with whom we cohabit the earth, then there is a limit to choice, a kind of constitutive unfreedom that defines who we are and even normatively who we must be. Now this reference to a constitutive unfreedom is very interesting to me because it flies in the face of the entire history of political theory where politics is generally construed as freedom, that we construct political societies uh, at least in part in order to be free. But the question of the refugee potentially imposes upon us a type of constitutive unfreedom where we are bound by ob obligations to other people um, before we even get going as political communities. So this is an important point that I want to come back to, but I just want to start with that as a sort of provocation that politics might be considered the realm of the unfree and, and maybe wrestle with that a little bit later on. So that's the epigraph, but here's the, the first paragraph. Nothing has changed, nothing has been learned, nothing has been remembered. The nothing grows and nothing that nihilates. Nihilism is the absence of meaning a world astray and an endless nothing that can entail only world catastrophes. And yet such a populous nothing, the number of stateless persons in the world now exceeds that at the time of the Second World War. That previous calamity should have been a permanent reminder to the world not to look away or fail to act. However, not only does the pile of wreckage and bodies continue to grow under the horrified gaze of Walter Benjamin's angel of history, but the world is every day more replete with the ghosts of those who could have been saved but were not. Lives lost because they were deliberately exterminated or drowned or excluded from access to asylum by non-entree policies that violate the obligation to uphold the principle of non-refoulement or turned back to murder or prison or immiserated for decades without hope in camp. This calamity is set to exponentially increase with the hastening effects of climate change. A numerous nothing then, perhaps like a disaster, 
a disaster of numbers and yet beyond numbers and beyond all counting in its endless expansion. A disaster which, as Maurice Blanchot put it, does not even have the ultimate for a limit, but bears the ultimate away in the disaster. A disaster related to forgetfulness, a failure to remember, to care and to think. A failure of politics and those who make it, but also those who think it. For while one can and should judge the failures of politicians, the poverty of political philosophy is also manifest in its temperate, pragmatic, liberal democratic iterations, the inexcusably tepid temperature of every calculation of prudence to borrow from Nietzsche when the fire alarm is clanging so loudly. Disaster past and perhaps greater disaster to come if disaster can even be measured and if nothing is done. Before the spark reaches the dynamite, as Walter Benjamin put it, the lighted fuse must be cut. So in this introduction, I'm really trying to evoke a sense of profound disappointment with the politics of asylum as it stands today. Um, as I say in that paragraph, the lessons from the Second World War when the, the sort of paradigmatic nature of the threat that the Jewish people and others were under at that time should have underscored, surely for all time, the uh, imperative of the safeguarding of human beings as such in all of their uh, diversity. And yet this has failed to manifest. It has failed to arrive. We still live in a world uh, of mass statelessness and refugees. As I said before, there's never been more refugees than there are now, and the number's always growing and could reach up to a billion by mid-century. So this is a complete moral and political failure on the, on the part of individual states as well as the international community. And something I want to get to a little bit later that underscores all this is, is a certain politics of, of ghosts, uh, of what, what the philosopher Jacques Derrida calls hauntology. Um, and I'll come back to this a bit later, but I think that politics should be informed by the memory of the disappeared, but of those who should be among us and their descendants, but who aren't. And that, uh, that any true politics of asylum must uh, have, it, have front of mind the memory of the disappeared. Okay, so that, that, that's sort of the, the end section of my book where, where I get to that sort of politics of haunting, of hauntology. Um, but before I get to that, what I try to do in this book is to outline uh, a set of arguments around what I think uh, a decent politics of asylum would be that would safeguard uh, those vulnerable human beings who need it. So someone who was personally affected by the events of the Second World War was the political theorist Hannah Arendt. Now, you may have heard of Arendt, who was the subject of a feature film a few years back, uh, and has written many famous books, most famously probably Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she covered the trial of Adolf Eichmann uh, in Jerusalem in 1960. So Arendt was German and Jewish, and she fled Germany in 1933 because she'd been involved in some early resistance activity against the Nazis. She became stateless herself and remained that way for nearly two decades until her naturalization in the United States. So as a direct witness, participant, and intellectual respondent to those events, her perspective is very illuminating. And what I argue, argue in my book is that Arendt bequeaths to us the possibility of a new concept of the political that she herself did not follow through on. She was a rather occasional thinker who would intervene at discrete moments uh, as events uh, were occurring in the political world, but she wasn't a systematic thinker. And, and what I've tried to do is not to correct the master, but to try to draw links between different um, elements of her work to come up with um, a, 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 an overall holistic theory of a right to asylum. So in, in one of her, her major works, The Origins of Totalitarianism, in the preface, she makes an extraordinary call for what she calls a new guarantee and a new law on earth based upon a new political principle. So what does this mean? What, what, what does it mean to call for a guarantee within the context of politics? As I was referring to before in, in the idea of unfreedom, to guarantee something in politics seems like binding one's hands. The one no longer has a choice, but one merely has to acquiesce to that which has been guaranteed. So this notion of a guarantee within the political, I found quite striking in a rent, because it's something that in most of her work, she resists. She worries about absolutism in politics. She thinks she defines politics as freedom. Uh, it's just simply freedom as such, as I was saying before, about 
uh, political theory. So this, this notion of a guarantee I found to be kind of a deconstructive moment in her work in that it almost threatens to undo her own work um, in its operations by stipulating that a guarantee must be given. So this call for a guarantee and a new law on earth to safeguard refugees I found very interesting. So what, so what, what would be the nature of this guarantee if we were to try to unpack a rent theory? So I, I want to uh, explain primarily with reference to two concepts. I'm going to try and keep this, keep the academic jargon out of it, um, and please do do ask me if you want me to clarify anything. But just broadly speaking, that there are two main concepts I want to hit here. Firstly, it's something called the right to have rights. So the right to have rights, again, is uh, from the origins of totalitarianism, which is really Arendt's critique of human rights, which were traditionally understood as natural rights. They're the rights that human beings hold simply because they are human beings. And Arendt argued that the mass statelessness at the time of the war revealed these rights were not worth the paper they were written on unless they were backed up by political membership. In other words, one only has rights if there is a state willing and able to uphold those rights. In her words, the world found nothing sacred in the abstract nakedness of being human. Thus, an international political order is needed that would ensure everyone finds a place to be safe and to belong. So the right to have rights means the right to enjoy political membership that would up uphold all of your other human rights. Okay, so this interesting and sort of strange doubling of terms uh, of the right to have rights. And this has become a great locus of scholarship um, in, the, in contemporary times. There's a lot of work being done on the rent and the right to have rights. And this is also a key part of my own argument. But I link it to another moment in Arendt where she talks about what she calls human plurality. So plurality can be understood in a couple of senses. And again, I, I, I want to keep it sort of jargon free. But plurality really goes to just simply the fact that there are there is a multitude of human beings on the earth who are different and distinct. And one can take this in a couple of different ways. We are distinct as individuals, but there's also a plurality of peoples of different you know ethnic groups and so on and that it is necessary to safeguard the plurality of human beings as such so i referred to arendt's book on adolf eichmann her charge against eichmann was that he arrogated to himself the right to decide with whom to share the earth and to her this was a crime against the givenness of human plurality as such that no one has the right to determine who gets to uh who they get to share the earth with and who lives and who dies. And so Eichmann's crime was a crime against plurality and seeking to put the Jewish people to death. But I think we can extend the logic, although no doubt a crime of a different order of severity, but still a crime in my view, against states who do not uphold the safety of, of human plurality by not uh, taking in people as refugees. Um, you know, for whatever the reason is, why they became vulnerable. Uh, and again, we can we can maybe come to later, like how we define the refugee, what the scope of that, what the, that category should be. But nevertheless, there is, for rent, there is a duty to uphold the givenness of human plurality on the earth. And to fail to do that is to commit an ontological crime, a crime against that which is of, of the plurality of human beings. And again, to return to this theme of, of unfreedom, Plurality needs to be understood as unchosen. In other words, we're sort of born into the world or thrown into the world, as Heidegger famously said, without a choice. We simply land here amongst human beings and different human groups that we did not choose. So again, this theme of unfreedom, we live in a world of people we did not choose. And therefore, the imperative of preserving human plurality in that context is something that rather than us choosing it is imposed upon us. That is, if we want to avoid the criminality of denying the right of human plurality to exist. This means that asylum is an incumbent duty upon all political communities. And that's why I go as, as, to, as far to say in the book that politics equals asylum. Now, when I say politics equals asylum, that can sound like a, an overly dramatic claim. Well, what I mean by that, to slightly clarify it, is but in, in French, they make the distinction between le politique and la politique, where le politique, it, politique is politics in its essence or its conceptuality, where la politique is just the sort of everyday work of, of politics. 
So, so the Ler politic is really what I'm talking about when I say politics equals asylum. It's that the, the heart or the essence of politics is that everyone on the earth should have a place to be safe and to belong. And to the extent that that doesn't exist, then politics is not fulfilled. And therefore, in a certain way, asylum is, is the secret heart of politics in that it provides everyone with, uh, it should provide everyone with uh, somewhere to belong. Um, so I'm going on quite a bit there. I, I wonder if it's a time to sort of pause and take any questions or, or I'm happy to keep going if you prefer. Absolutely. We're more than happy to pause for a moment. Does anybody have any questions? I have a comment that I'm loving it. Oh, good. <laughs> As am I. This is absolutely fascinating. So thank you, Nathan. We really appreciate this. So um, if you're happy to keep on going, um, I think uh, um, I think Christian's been taking some notes. So I'm sure we'll have some questions crop up shortly. I do have one question. Oh, great. Of course I do. I'm wondering if, um, and you may be, a, may be planning to bring this into the talk later, there is also a parallel issue of zero population growth. Does, uh, does that have an impact on your thoughts with um, with the topic we're talking about with refugees? Thank, thank you. Could you just elaborate on that a little bit? When you say zero population growth, do you mean that that's a goal we should be aiming at or that's a political problem or, or how, do you, um, how do you make that? I'm not advocating for or against. I know there are some people in the Democrats who are very much um, in favour of it, but I'm just wondering if it comes into um, the topic of refugees at all, and perhaps that's further down the track. Very, very much so. In fact, I, I was going to bring up what I call the problem of numbers a bit later. Sorry, what's your name? Lucy. Lucy. Thank you so much, Lucy. I'm glad you raised this because, yeah, this is precisely a theme I was going to get to a little bit later in my talk. Perhaps actually I can even engage it um, now as we proceed, but I think you're absolutely right. There is this, this question of, uh, the, I mean, we can take it in a few senses. There's the overall population of the earth, especially in an era of climate change and resources and so on. And then there's the question of numbers in relation to refugees and migration. Because as I alluded to before, there is an ongoing debate in, in the scholarship around this uh, I'm actually giving a talk on this tomorrow about the refugee migrant distinction, because as I indicated earlier, you know, climate, uh, what I would call climate refugees are not counted as refugees. And you can extend that to, you know, women fleeing domestic violence, other things that don't constitute political persecution. And there's a lot of debates and, and sort of legal uh, challenges and legal development that's going on around this. But, but to sort of come to, to your, your question, uh, I mean, there's quite a bit of sadness, but I'll try and do it briefly. I mean, Firstly, I'd say I'm suspicious of, of sort of Malthusian uh, thinking. So Thomas Malthus was, I don't know if you're familiar, was this English economist who argued that, that population growth would always outstrip the ability basically to feed people um, and that there needed to be control uh, of population. And this logic persists today. Uh, I'm very suspicious of this uh, in the context of economic exploitation where resources are not distributed, not even equally, but not even equitably, um, let alone equally, is what I meant to say. So in that context, I think we should be on our guard against the arguments that foreground global population as the preeminent problem rather than issues of, of fairness and distribution. So I, I'd say that in the broad sense globally. In terms of refugees, I think it's a non-issue because the population of refugees, the total population of refugees in the world while large could easily be accommodated by existing states or even just by, say, the states of the global north. It, it, it's a lack of political will rather than any pragmatic consideration that is preventing that. Um, okay. Do you want to respond at all and then I can... No, I don't want to respond. I was just interested in your thoughts on the topic. And I know there, like I said, I know there are um, several people within the Democrats um, who are very interested in the topic of um, population growth and um, things like that. But yeah, I mean, you see images um, on in the media of um, incredible numbers of refugees and you sort of wonder whether there is a tie-in with that with um, population growth and everything like that but that was all you've covered it i think it's such a vital question i'm so glad you raised it i mean if you think about the, i mentioned the haitians at the border of the united states i mean that's fourteen thousand people approaching a country of over 300 million it's it's literally a drop, a drop in the ocean, as it were, to use a, a trouble, a troubling uh, phrase, perhaps in this context. But yeah, like it's a, it's a non-issue statistically. 
but yeah, it's so important. I'm really glad it was raised. Sorry, Nathan, I'd, I'd just like to comment as well, because I, I think uh, I agree with Lucy that she's raised such an important point. And I think the members of the Democrats who are concerned about population growth are concerned about it in the context of uh, sustainability and particularly for the climate and environment and, and, and things. Um, and I think it's, it's a highly vexed issue politically in terms of right. it's very easy to, um, uh, what's the word, um, catastrophize it and 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 you know um, scaremonger with it um, and it's something you know and I'm sure that you'll get to this but it's obviously something that the you know the coalition has done to devastating effect over the last 20 years and um, it's really really difficult to talk about sustainable population without overtones of uh, you know xenophobia and, and eugenics coming into it as well so any thoughts that you have on that would be fantastic as well. Yeah, uh, thank you again for that. That's a fantastic comment. Um, a couple of years ago, Hillary Clinton counseled appeasement to the states of Europe. She was saying that precisely this problem, this problem of xenophobia and the right using uh, this issue as um, a way to sort of gin up fear and therefore gain office and become, you know, to make the world even worse. My, my response to that is we shouldn't, uh, that capitulation isn't to me. I mean, we shouldn't be bowing I mean, I mean, it's literal a, a, a appeasement in in the cham in the Chamberlain sense um, of the of the worst impulses. I think it requires sort of counter organisation. It requires organising. Um, it requires solidarity. Um, but but as you say, like the damage from those kind of discourses is is great. I, I don't know that I have anything too profound to say other than it, it simply requires combat. And, and I'm pleased mm. that that the Democrats are are combating it. I'm so glad because um, it, it's come up a couple of times in discussions on our Facebook page and I've had a, um, I, I'm one of the team that runs the Facebook page and, and I've had a couple of discussions with people and they're going, oh, but you know, you, um, and, and it's in, again, in the context of climate where they've sort of said, well, your climate policy is great, except it's, use, you know, not useless, but there's no point discussing this without the context of a sustainable population. And mm. it's been a real uh, kind of thing because, um, on the one hand, you know, you have to go through a little bit of unpacking with that person to work out because sustainable population is um, because of the history of this thing uh, being weaponized and that by, you know, bad faith actors, you kind of have to unpack things a bit with people when they're commenting on this and work out from where they're coming from. And, you know, and mm. much to my relief, we've always worked out that these people are coming from it from the right place, which is they're concerned about the planet as opposed to it being, you know, sort of xenophobia in disguise kind of thing. So it's even for those of us who want to combat it, it can be really hard sometimes to make sure that, um, um, you know, the, the conversations being had in good faith and that the uh, the outcomes that we're all looking for are actually aligned. Absolutely. I think that's so well said. And just to maybe support your point, I mean, one, one ready response is that it's not – if one is seriously concerned about climate, it's not a question of the total numbers in terms of population. It's a question, as, as I'm sure you know, of the energy usage per person in terms of, I don't know what the statistics are now, they keep changing, but whether it's 10 times or 50 times, like the consumption of people who live in the global north as opposed to the global south, um, and the continuing extraction of resources from the global south by the global north. So I think if one is really going to have a serious conversation about this, the 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 polite rejoinder to, to people who put these views would be to say uh, it's necessary to examine again this from a perspective of fairness or of distribution of you know how power works how finance works um and the overconsumption in the global north i, I think that's maybe maybe a way to approach it yeah nathan just just for your reference um uh steve has, has commented in the chat that the key consideration is whether or not we're living within the means of the land and the oceans to sustain us and a vibrant uh, biodiversity, population, consumption per capita, and the material and resources, cost of production, distribution, and storage are interrelated components of that overarching issue. And he went on to say that we waste around 30% of the food we produce, for example, 40% right. of the world are malnourished to some extent. The distribution of food is wildly unequal. Lots for us to work on. Yeah, I think Steve has nailed it. <laughs> yeah, I think I agree with all of that. Absolutely. I mean, it's a complex discussion, but yeah, as, as long as as long as it doesn't get reduced, as I say, to this sort of Malthusian logic of it's just a population problem, as long as it's a more sophisticated discussion, then I think, yeah, it's an important one to be had in terms of, of sustainable biodiversity and so on.
Fantastic. And uh, before we get started again, um, Sujay has got a hand up. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you. Um, Nathan, I don't mean this in an insulting way, but are you available, uh, aware of the poem called Refugee Blues by W.H. Auden? Uh, no, I'm familiar with Auden, but I, I don't know that poem, no. It starts, say this city has 10 million souls. Some are living in mansions, some are living in holes. Yet there's no place for us, my dear, yet there's no place for us. January 1, 1939, and our grade six teacher read that to us in class, and refugees have haunted me ever since. Gosh, that is wow, stunning. That, mm. I think um, if I'm, this is just a sort of an aside, but I'm pretty sure that Alden proposed marriage to a rent, and, and she knocked him back, um, maybe just to sort of close the circle on this comment here. Um, but yeah, that's, I'm not sure if Alden was thinking of a rent when he wrote that, but um, yeah, it's a, it, that's a wonderful poem. I have to look that up. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ujjah. That was awesome. So, Nathan, uh, we don't have any other sort of um, questions, I think, at the moment. So if you want to um, uh, keep going, then we're all ears. Sure, thank you. Well, this is great, and the comments have been fantastic. So thank you, everyone, and, and thank you for putting up with the audio only, but um, I, I assure you, you're not missing anything. But, um, yeah, maybe if I can come back to the comment was made about the this question of numbers. I mean, one of the chapters on my in my book is a full frontal attack on Aristotle, which might sound a little strange, but Aristotle sort of preaches or, or counsels the virtue of moderation, and this has become a sort of leitmotif of, of political theory down literally through millennia. Um, that that one shouldn't go to excess in, in political activity. And what I try to argue in my book is there are there are moments there are moments where precisely one should go to excess in order, as I say, to safeguard human plurality. So one concrete example that I use in my um, chapter against Aristotle, and it maybe it's a kind of I don't know if it's an emotional blackmail, but it but it makes the point I think starkly is that there was something uh, during, oh, prior to the Second World War called the Kinder Transport. I don't know if people have heard of this, but the United Kingdom in 1938, after Kristallnacht, took in 10,000 Jewish children. They basically uh, went by rail from uh, middle of Europe and Germany to the coast and were um, taken over by boat to the United Kingdom. And those children were saved from the Shoah, from the Holocaust during the war because of this Kinder Transport. But as I point out in the book, there's one and a half million children who were exterminated in the death camps. And, and that's just the children, that's not counting the adults. Um, so, and you know, there were not only Jewish children, but Roma children and others. And so if one, is, if one proceeds by the lights of moderation in the context of the politics of asylum, one is already putting people to death by saying, we can only do sim so much, we can only go so far and so on. And precisely a politics of immoderation of a sort of gracious welcome where, where gracious, you know, in its etymology and the meaning of the word means, you know, you know, freely given without uh, reference to calculation. But this is required at certain his, historical moments or in order, again, to safeguard human plurality. So, so this is why I say I'm so glad that this question of numbers came up, um, because I think one has to combat the logic of numbers, the logic of moderation in the name of a different principle, even a sort of self-binding of, of an unfreedom of politics where asylum is seen as the very realisation of politics as such. Hence this, this and what I might call an antinomy, not to use a big word, but as, as, an antinomy is where you have two laws that are both operating on you, but they're contradictory. So the antinomy of the guarantee is that you, politics is perceived as a space of freedom, but to protect human beings precisely requires unfreedom in terms of guaranteeing that people will be protected. So in a way, Arendt's call for a guarantee and the way that I interpret it, it kind of mirrors totalitarianism, strangely enough, in that it sounds like an absolutism. But the absolutism that I endorse is one which would protect all of humanity rather than subjugate all of humanity. So there's an interesting sort of mirroring of logic because I'm saying that politics, in strictly in the context of asylum, is a space of unfreedom, even in the face of large numbers. Um, but yeah, this, this can seem, uh, you know, authoritarian because of that, because of the delimitation of freedom. But I argue that it's simply necessary to protect human life. 
And maybe just to expound on that a little bit more, we need to understand that even just having borders is a deadly protest. There's a book by a fellow called Reese Jones called Violent Borders, Refugees and the Right to Move, where he, he shows how tens of thousands of people die each year at borders. Uh, just because there are borders, it means that people die. Uh, and for example, some of the border towns uh, in Mexico next to the United States are the deadliest towns in the world. 80% of all women and girls who transit through Mexico to the United States are raped. It's, it's such a frequent um, phenomenon that they usually take birth control because they know it's going to happen. Um, you know, the deaths in the Mediterranean, uh, people trying to cross by boat and so on. So the, the failure to accept people and to actively safeguard people in terms of what I call an ethos of responsibility, where it's not just that you sort of let people in or open your door, but you actually go out and try to help people. Um, is required in order to forestall this this violence and this this death. I'm sorry, it's a terribly dark subject, but uh, it sort of it really rather needs to be said. Um, yeah, and and that perhaps brings me to to my final sort of broad theme for the evening, which is this question of hauntology. So this idea that uh, politics should be done uh, in memory of the uh, disappeared, of those who should be among us but who aren't. Uh, and I thought uh, to get into that, I'd again just do a small reading from the book, from the the opening uh, paragraphs of the final section of the book, which I call the coda, because I, I sort of throughout the book I try to make this argument about plurality and an ethos of responsibility, the right to have rights. But then at the end I turn around and I I sort of say all of this is in the name of the disappeared, and that's what we also need to keep in mind. So if it's okay, I'll I'll do a reading. I'm just going to quickly have a sip. My my mouth's running dry. But then I'll, I'll do this reading. One moment. Take your time. So the coda is called Politics of Hauntology slash of Missing Persons. And I've got some quotes here as epigraphs that I'll quickly read as well. So Umberto Eco says, we tell the story of the cabin boy who came back. We do not tell the stories of the 99 sailors who drowned. Obvious reference to Moby Dick, I think. So another quote, from out of this landscape, two figures emerge. Those are the ghost and the child, the only witnesses at the end. And finally, a quote from Leonard Cohen, who's basically God to me, who says, the war, the children missing, Lord, it's almost like the blues, and, and which ties back to the, the reference to the poem about refugee blues. The war, the children missing, Lord, it's almost like the blues. It's an incredible line. But so the first section of, of this coda um, is called Les Enfants des Yeux, the children of his yeux. So I think, I think rather than explain, I'll just read it. I think it will explain itself. Izu is one of the most beautiful places I have ever seen. It is a tiny, tiny hamlet gathered around a crystal blue lake, nestled in a valley in the hills of southeastern France, the snow-capped Alps forming a glorious backdrop to the peaceful, even idyllic landscape. And yet experiencing these lovely environs only confirms for me the truth of Adorno's dictum that even the blossoming tree lies, lies in the sense of lying in terms of telling an untruth. The moment its bloom is seen without the shadow of terror. For I'd been inspired to make a pilgrimage of a kind to his you, trained from Paris to Lyon, trained from Lyon to a small town called Tour de Pin, and from there a long taxi ride deep into the countryside, in order to pay my respects to a group of 44 Jewish children who were deliberately disappeared from the earth by the Nazis. I became aware of this microcosm of the Shoah because of a documentary called Hotel Terminus, directed by Marcel Ophuls, who had himself been a Jewish child refugee who fled with his family from the Nazis during the war. This film, so named for the hotel in Lyon that the Gestapo had commandeered as their headquarters during the occupation, examines the crimes, flight into exile, arrest and trial of Klaus Barbie, a Gestapo agent who had operated in occupied Lyon. Infamously, he captured and tortured to death the head of the resistance, Jean Moulin. Even more infamously, it was Dinesieux in April 1944 that Barbie rounded up 44 Jewish children who were a mix of French citizens and refugees from other European states and who were in hiding from deportation, far from home and from their parents. Barbie went a great deal out of his way to find these children. The Jew was a small and remote place, not a major population centre, which itself is a telling sign of the absolutism of the Nazis' murderous drive to pursue that insane war within the war, the final solution at a time when the other war had already turned against the Nazis and D-Day was imminent. He spared no effort to find them and was successful. Consequently, all of them were murdered in Auschwitz, along with several adults deported with them. 
Previously, I had had the good fortune to study on scholarship in Paris and had been struck during my stroll through the city by the plaques that adorn the walls of so many schools within the peripherique. That's the sort of inner, sort of old part of Paris, people who don't know. So and so number of children were deported on this date in 1940X. Doubly jarring from when from within the walls of those same schools that I would pass, the happy screams of the children at play would issue forth. Were there other screams, I wondered, when the end came for the children memorialised on the wall? Or was it more like as depicted in, in Louis Mal's masterpiece, Au revoir les enfants, when the arrest of the Jewish children happened mostly in a chilled silence, broken only by the barked commands of the Gestapo agent, in the few brief au revoirs before the final shot lingers on the empty doorway through which the deportees have passed? Mal's voice voiceover comments that despite the passage of 40 years, he has never forgotten the events of that January morning. After I'd finished my tour of the memorial, I sat on the steps of the Maison des Yeux, the boarding school where they had stayed. And looking down across that peaceful valley, I tried to conjure by hallucination the moment in this gentlest of places when the truck pulled up and the Nazi soldiers and the SS officers got out and started rounding up children. At one point, they kicked the child hard in the stomach when he resisted and violently threw another, even younger child, up into the truck. They also briefly detained one non-Jewish child whom they released once it was established that he wasn't Jewish. I tried to imagine the faces of the 44 children full of fear, driven to Montluc prison in Lyon that night, then forced onto a series of trains ending in Terminus Auschwitz, where one of the adults who accompanied them, the only survivor of the Isier deportees, testified that the sky itself was blood red and seemed to be on fire, where all the children without exception were exterminated, presumably immediately upon arrival, as was standard practice in the treatment of children in that hell. Nearly done. The next day, once I had returned to Lyon from Isieux, I visited Montluc prison, where the children had been detained for a night prior to their onward journey to Auschwitz. Following his capture in South America and extradition to France nearly 40 years later, Klaus Barbie himself was briefly and symbolically returned to Montluc while awaiting trial. Later the same day, I lingered on the steps of the Palais de Justice in Lyon and reflected on that trial, the first concerning crimes against humanity in the history of France and the many issues it had raised. It was a highly controversial affair. Barbie's defenders, led by an infamous lawyer named Jacques Vergès, tried to put France itself in the dock by pointing out how the French had tortured in Algeria, just as Barbie had done in Lyon, arguing that the horrors of its colonial crimes rendered it incapable of passing judgment on the old Nazis, a so-called rupture defence strategy. That is, Vergès ranged horror against horror, victim against victim, and indicted the bourgeois French system's attempt to administer justice in an effort to deliberately confuse matters and in the end to make it appear that the Nazi in the dock also belonged in the category of victims. Finally, completing this idiosyncratic tour of unhappiness, in the twilight of dusk, I walked to the hotel terminus itself, now operating under another name and doing business as usual. It is a large grand hotel built in a classic style, a beautiful old building. I sat under a tree, under a tree opposite the hotel as the night descended and looked up at the darkening facade, contemplating the time when the Gestapo were using it as their base and people were being dragged across the lobby to an unknown fate. As I sat there across the way, two children, a girl and a boy, came bouncing along the footpath in front of their parents and bundled happily through the entrance into the foyer. And I thought about those other children and that other time while the street lights came up and the sun went down on the dark hotel. So what I'm really trying to say in this passage is that the children of Azu are gone, but they shouldn't be really very simple i mean they they could still be alive today i mean second world war has not quite passed into history to the extent that its protagonists to the extent that they were young are still alive um so they could be here they their children their grandchildren their great-grandchildren could all be here but they aren't and that therefore we are surrounded by ghosts whether we see them or not um so even though the children of you are disappeared their memory really lingers on it and and some of the gestures that I, I'm trying to make in that passage, I, I hope they're sort of evident, is that, for example, the Hotel Terminus was the very locus of Gestapo evil. It's now just operating as a normal hotel. So it, it's maybe sort of analogous in some way. Perhaps one has to be careful with the analogy, but to you know, the dispossession of Indigenous lands, 
where you know life goes on, business as usual carries on, and and one doesn't you know feel that one one's bed is burning to borrow to borrow Minot Earl's phrase. Um, the same with Isu, as I said, it's an incredibly beautiful little hamlet, and one would never know from the external beauty the horror that had gone on there. Um, so I so I try to outline this this politics of hauntology that Derrida elaborates, which uh, is attentive to the memory of the dead uh, as a locus of um, the, uh, of present political concerns and about trying to uh, draw the appropriate lessons from that. And maybe and maybe just to to say one final thing about how to think about this. I don't know if people um, saw a film a couple of years ago that was called Transit. Uh, the director, I think his name's Christian Petzold. So Transit is a novel by uh, a German novelist named Anna Segers, who's written a few great novels. Um, and basically it's about a, a German refugee who's in Marseille in France in 1941 and trying to get a transit pass to leave um, as a, like because Marseille was one of the last sort of exits out of the nightmare at that time. It was basically Marseille or Lisbon or Istanbul sort of trying to get off the continent. But the, the interesting gesture of this film and the same sort of gesture that's operative throughout my book is that the filmmaker takes the 1941 story and shows that story but shows it in the present day so it's this 1941 story against the nazis but it's set in contemporary marseille and therefore amongst the immigrants uh and the refugees who currently populate marseille and and europe and and so in a way it sort of blends past and present in a very interesting way and and that's what i try to do in this section of the book and also throughout the book is to is to show uh, the way in which, um, you know, that, that not much has changed, really. I mean, there, there are some intellectuals, and I have these debates all the time, that, that would resist the comparison of one time with another. There is this sort of injunction to always historicise and to keep things in their, in their sort of historical boxes. And, I, and I'm against this. I, I think we need to draw lessons. Well, I, I know the wisdom of it, but I also think we need to, to draw lessons. Um, and, and in one place in my book, I show where... Uh, the, the quotes given by governments of the treatment of refugees, if you lift them out of context, you wouldn't know if the quotes from the 1930s or from the 2000s. Um, so, for example, there was debate in France in the 30s about whether their internment centres should be called concentration camps or not, which also occurred um, under the Trump administration uh, at the border. So there was that big debate about whether they should be called concentration camps. And there's a few other examples like that where the past and the present uh, come to be almost identical. I mean, you know, Mark Twain, you know, the apocryphal uh, saying is that history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And in the context of refugees, I think uh, uh, history is rhyming very strongly, uh, very loudly uh, at this point, clanging, in fact. Um, so perhaps in terms of prepared remarks, I know I've gone a little over time. Uh, maybe I'll pause again there if, if anyone would like to question or... I don't think anyone's upset about you going over time. This has been completely <laughs> riveting. Um, uh, Chris has his hand up, so I'll hand over to him and then to Julia. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, uh, to backtrack a little bit, you were talking about um, breaking down the borders and opening up um, for the refugees to be able to come to countries and all of that. Um, I was wondering something that, stuck out to me was just realising how citizens have got a really interesting perspective to outsiders. And I was wondering if you had any ideas on how to bring people along on that journey if you were to open up the borders to all refugees. Thank you so much for that question. I think that's a vital one in terms of of strategy of how one addresses all this. I mean, if you think about the the Biloela family, um, and the, the community response to that in, in what I take to, to be, a, a, you know, in general terms, a conservative state is that in Queensland, because I don't think it's just the local community that's behind that family. It's interesting the way in which when people get to know people um, from elsewhere and with different traditions and customs and so on, they, they come to like them very often. Um, so it, it almost sounds like too easy an answer, but actually getting people sort of exposed to difference to other human beings and seeing that in many ways they're just like them. I mean, that, that that's one approach. I mean, it, it's difficult because as was observed before, we've, we've had, frankly, not just the coalition government, but Labor governments have been ginning up the fear around this and xenophobia and 
using it uh, as a sort of political cudgel. I mean, when it comes to the politics of asylum, I I have no more sympathy for Labor or or very little more than I do for the Liberal Party. Um, So it's, it's of course, just very difficult in that context to to, uh, try to make this type of change as possible. But nonetheless, that's the horizon of struggle that I think has, has to be the horizon, as it were. Um, in ter- just, just to slightly sort of clarify, like you referred to boys, I'm not actually advocating, it's maybe a slightly sophisticated, um, detailed area to get into, but I'm not actually calling for open borders. I think mean, you could still have a border, but uh, you could have it more or less as porous. Uh, and, and most especially for people who are vulnerable, I do think you can make some distinctions between refugees and migrants, but I would have a more elastic con- uh, concept of what who and what constitutes a refugee. Uh, I shouldn't say what, just who, <laughs> who constitutes a refugee. Um, so, for example, climate change or, as I said before, you know, victims of domestic violence, other pressures, you know, crop failure, things that force people to move that don't currently get counted as refugee. refugees. So that's not the same as saying that everyone should be able to move everywhere they want, whenever they want. Um, so what I want is a politics of responsibility that's attentive to, especially to human vulnerability and the need to safeguard human life and, and human plurality does that make sense it does beautiful thank you so much thank you for great question great julia do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question i'm sorry julia king member of the democrats um hi, julia. hi nathan this is a talk on refugees um i had i need to explain myself um for decades i've been um a very strong supporter of palestine um, to, to me, over these decades, I've become incredibly fed up with um, the Jewish people, if you like, the state of Israel, whoever you like, um, hijacking grief, the whole concept of grief, okay? Yeah. I was a child in Europe during the war and I lost both my parents. So I don't want to be told about grief. Now, you've taken an extraordinarily narrow view well, no, of but the Holocaust know. as yeah, your basis for talking of refugees. Now, the Holocaust really has been done to death academically, intellectually, on social media, whatever way you want to talk about it. Um, I'm, my own interest in refugees is um, the impact of imperialism and colonialism, and I don't see how we can talk about refugees without bringing those things in because that is still unresolved. The, um, you know, we can blame the Nazis for the Holocaust and do a thousand things, but we have to blame to some extent the imperial powers and expect something more from them. So I'm just, I suppose it's almost not a question, it's more of a comment on, I'm shaking actually, Um, I'm disturbed. And that's not hard to do when you have a background like me. I don't want to be told endlessly about the Holocaust. I don't want to have people, as they constantly do, say to me I'm anti-Semitic when I'm simply making a comment about the latest barbarity in Palestine. Well, I don't, I don't think that's the record. So, I don't think you're anti-Semitic. Sorry? I don't think you're anti-Semitic. I mean, may I respond? Is that, do you want, you want to find I know I'm not anti-Semitic. That's absolutely true. I don't need to be told that. Okay, have you finished your point or do, can I respond or do you want to finish your point? No, I'd love you to respond, but I'd love you to respond in some broader sense, if you would. No, absolutely. So, so I'm glad you said it, Julie. Like, sort of, so much of the book is is concerned with the show, but there is a pivot in this coda to, uh, to um, trying to what what's called as a literature, try to engage with what's called multi-directional memory. So to bring different experiences of persecution into dialogue. So Walter Benjamin talks about what he calls the tradition of the oppressed, where both Jewish people and Palestinians fall under that. And I actually completely agree with you. Like, I oppose the state of Israel policies in terms of the illegal occupation of the West Bank um, and the treatment of people in Gaza. I, uh, I think one needs to be careful and make distinctions between the right-wingers who tend to control Israel 
and Jewish people more broadly construed. So I would never put it in terms of I'm criticizing the Jewish people. I'm criticizing the policies of a state which has a largely Jewish character and is run by a particular set of Jewish people who have hard right wing views that are that are anathema to me. Um, so I, I completely share your solidarity with the solidar- solidarity, excuse me, with the Palestinian people. Um, I was just going to say. Uh, I, I quote in the book here a fellow called Marcel Liebman, who was who was a Jewish survivor. He he wrestles with the problem of of refusing to simply memorialize his deported brother, which I think is what you're getting at, but keeping the trauma of this memory open as a question. As with Judith Butler, he refuses a reading of this history that would justify the actions of the state of Israel. I'm reading from my book against the Palestinians but rather universalizes the lesson into one of anti-racism in addressing his disappeared brother. Any obligation I felt to the dead of the war, and if one wished to personalize this to one of them in particular, is a duty that comes down to this, holding the racism that murdered them to be a crime in which one never colludes. If one could imagine what duty the living have to the dead, I really believe that my brother could not ask for anything more. In other words, it's precisely, or should be in my view, a historical lesson of the Shoah that people not be persecuted and uh, deported and potentially exterminated. And that this, of course, applies to the Palestinians as it applies to all people, because Palestinians are a part of human plurality as such. So I I think we largely agree. I'm I'm not... uh, It's difficult to do justice, and I have indeed emphasised the Holocaust in my remarks tonight. Um, It's difficult to to sort of lay out the whole book in in an hour or so, um, or less. But I, I just want to note that I, I hear your concerns and I share your concerns, and I do address this, this very point uh, in my book. And indeed, Judith Butler has written a great book that you might like called Parting Ways, where she tries to show how Palestinians and Jewish people have a shared experience of exile and persecution, which could function as the basis of a truly just state in Israel slash Palestine. Um, yeah, there's a lot more one could say, but perhaps I'll leave it there. I think I think you've misread me completely, Nathan. My argument isn't all about Palestine. Um, that's not the issue. My argument is well. This sorry, this notion of the Holocaust has been done to death. I really take issue with that. Is, Most people, well, I'm there's, interested. There's statistics that people that aren't even aware of it, especially young people, and this idea of forgetting is very worrisome. So I completely disagree with you on that. Um, I was hoping for a broader view, as I said, um, a very obvious one is imperialism. Um, I, I, my argument is I know a huge amount about Palestine and Israel, so I don't need to know more about that, and that's not my argument. My, I just placed myself in a position and said there's a whole other view, and we're talking about refugees today, so I don't know why we've been talking about the Holocaust. Uh, my interest is refugees today. Okay, well, I've explained at length why, why these histories informed each other, and I did indicate at the start that the history of colonialism and the way the borders uh, have been formed is a part of that context. Well, you know, one of the reasons why, um, you know, we have the production of refugee populations, like the Afghans, you know, Afghanistan has been subject to, uh, you know, interventions, whether it's Britain or Russia or the United States, for more than a century. Um, the Haitians are on the move now because of the de- destabilization that the United States is, is in great part responsible for. So I, I, I share your views on that, like that they, we're not divided on that question. Thank you. No, thank you. I know I, I appreciate the comment and, and being pushed on it. Um, yeah, I do apologize. It's hard to do justice to, to the whole text in this talk, but I've, I'm more than happy to talk with people um, further if they would like. Thanks, Julia. We appreciate that. I'm so sorry that um, um, this has been a little bit difficult for you. Um, Sujay, you've got your hand up. Did you um, have a question or a comment? I'll try and keep this brief. Um, Just getting back to what Christian was saying, um, I I wonder if you're aware of Ghassan Haj. He's a Lebanese-Australian writer on multiculturalism and that kind of thing. Uh, Sorry, say the name again. Ghassan, G-H-A-S-S-A-N, Haj, H-A-G-E. No, I'm not, I don't know that I'm familiar with that particular writer. Um, 
He, I heard him at a conference and he was talking about Australians' um, attitude to migrants. And he said, it's like having rabbits on your lawn. If you have a couple of rabbits on your lawn, oh, look, how cute are the rabbits? If you have a whole bunch of rabbits on your lawn, you start to worry about the condition of your lawn. And I suspect the Biloela family is something along the lines of rabbits on the lawn. The problem is when, when we start getting numbers of people, they lose their personhood. And I wonder if you've got any thoughts about how, to, how we keep the personhood of large numbers of refugees. I think that's an interesting comment. Um, I'm not a fan of that uh, analogy. I don't think that's a particularly good one, to be honest with you. Um, uh, I, do, I do see the problem of, you know, if there's a significant number of people, they can be perceived as a mass. But I mean, at the local level, that's not really true. I mean, every discrete individual and family uh, will be uh, encountered by their neighbours, by the people who live next to them on their street, in their neighbourhood. And for each unique, discrete person or family, let's say, um, they become, you know, real people, just as well, just as real as the Bilawala family. So, so I think that this, this uh, uh, scholar, although I'm not familiar with him, I think he's trafficked in, in the kind of, the kind of moderate uh, views that I particularly take issue with. And I'm sure he's a lovely fellow. I don't know anything about him. I, I see from Google that he's an anthropologist, which is not my field. Um, but yeah, the, the, this, this metaphor, of, I mean, that that's already a, a silly and problematic metaphor in as much as it construes human beings as as an animal which is sometimes exterminated which is precisely the type of language we should avoid in this context um but having said that i, I do acknowledge i see your point around the the way in which people people on mass become less uh personalized and so so i suppose coming back to what we were talking about before it's precisely that that the horizon of struggle that we personalize people, that they, people have a faith, that they have a voice, that we show our solidarity, uh, that they'd be welcomed and accepted in the community, and that we, we simply combat and resist efforts to, to dehumanize and depersonalize these people. Is, is that make sense? It does. It, what he said had a truth for me in the sense that if people have unconscious bias towards certain ethnic groups, they can live side by side and never encounter each other because of those barriers. Yeah, I mean, to me, like, like uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I can't speak from too much experience. I mean, I'm sort of middle-aged now. Um, uh, maybe I don't have enough of this historical perspective, but to me, multiculturalism works very well in this country uh, in large part with, with no doubt um, some tensions and issues that occasionally flare up. Uh, but but it's been a profound success story on the whole, um, from what I can see. So I don't really share share these concerns in that way. And I do think this this talk about rabbits and, and numbers, yeah, I, I I'm not I don't know exactly how it was phrased and so on, but yeah, it doesn't it doesn't sound promising to me that that discourse. It um, might so be thank more... you for raising it. <laughs> Sorry, Nathan. I was going to say I think it might be more a reflection on the way. Uh, the refugee crisis has been weaponized by um, bo well, both sides of politics over the last 20 years uh, for short-term political gain. Um, it, it probably feeds into, into to that rabbit's analogy a little bit. Um, one thing that I found super interesting about your talk is, is um, uh, apart from being a political nerd, I'm also a historic, history nerd, is as you said, like we've not learned the lessons of, of World War II and the Holocaust. And you know, I, I think there's a, a direct line that can be drawn from the stories that you've told of the children being deported right through to the images that we've seen recently of the fall of Kabul and Afghans, you know, climbing onto the last flight out of Kabul for freedom to get away from the Taliban. And, um, you know, and then tying into that, the way Australia has approached refugees over the last couple of decades and the, um, you know, because Australia was not just a signatory to the UN Convention on Refugees. We were one of its authors and we have trashed that legacy because we have not complied with that convention for some time now. And we have right. engaged in practices like reformant uh, by turning back boats and by, um, you know, 
denying asylum to people who have been displaced because of wars that we have contributed to and taken part in. And um, the moral obligation on us as a country to help the people of Afghanistan and Iraq and all the other areas that we have, you know, happily uh, gone to war and, uh, you know, sort of on behalf in, in terms of, you know, trying to deliver democracy to those countries and, and uh, you know, uh, as Julia uh, referred to, the, the imperialism and colonialism inherent in those acts, um, you know, I mean, yes, it's a complex issue, but um, I feel that there is a clear moral um, failing on us as a country for all of that. Absolutely. I think that's so well said. Um, and I completely agree. Like, yeah, and I think Julia's right in, in, what she, in drawing our attention to the history of colonialism. And if you think about Israel-Palestine, you know, it's the Balfour Declaration, um, it's the, the meddling of Western powers in that region through to, it, as you say, our imperialist interventions um, in the Middle East and elsewhere. And ab uh, I think that's, that's one of the sources of our responsibility. We are responsible because of our actions. But also I'm a little bit, I have a slight reservation about construing, I have a, almost a more sort of, sort of ideal theory around asylum in that I just want to say that this pertains to every political community at every moment because if we're awaiting the, the deconstruction of borders and of imperial empires and their logics and their power and so on, we're going to be waiting forever. So I want a politics of asylum that's operative at every moment. But I do think that, that what you're saying, what, what Julie was saying, um, that absolutely uh, has to be part of the story. And it is part of the story for me, to be clear. I just, you know, I haven't laid out enough of my book um, to make that sufficiently clear. So apologies. But, um, but yeah, absolutely. I, I, I completely agree. Oh no, and I think that's and look, we're not expecting you to to have all the answers tonight. Um, I think you you've given us an opportunity to have um, a very interesting and robust discussion on this. And you know, as a uh, political party, um, you know, we are looking for um, you know, I guess what's the word? Probably guidance is probably the wrong word, but um, you know, we are um, all of our our policy suite are living documents and, and um, you know, we take pride in the fact that um, our policies will evolve and change as the evidence and, and you know, the world changes essentially. And I think the, you know, you're right, like it is a discussion that we as a nation need to start having. It's a discussion that we as a nation uh, need to, uh, not as a discussion, uh, there are practical steps that we as a nation should start making, I think, to um, you know, start enacting the, you know, the breaking down of those borders and, and the breaking down of the, um, you know, the imperial and colonial legacies that lead to, uh, you know, right. the, to refugees. And and I think also, I mean, again, it ties into climate change and it ties into our place as an, uh, an emitter and a contributor to emitters through our exports of coal and gas. The islands of the Pacific are not very happy with us, with, you know, and quite justifiably so because they can see sea levels rising and their way of life is under threat. And we are right. directly contributing to that through, um, you know, our, our love of, of shipping off coal and, and, and gas to, you know, overseas to burn. And I, I feel like, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like that a big part of the theme of your book is, is simply, it is accountability to us as a nation and, and, you know, other nations as well, but we have a responsibility to our fellow citizens around the world as a nation to do the right thing and if you know if people are displaced because of of wars that we have chosen to take part in or the fact that um you know their islands have submerged because we contributed to sea level rise we have a moral and ethical responsibility to those people to give them sanction i completely agree yeah i completely agree with you i mean yeah as i tried to say like we have responsibility based on you know our sort of neo-imperialist behavior and the things that we've done but but also as i say i think I try to argue in, in the book that we actually just have a responsibility regardless to that all human communities have responsibility to safeguard human plurality as such, whether it's the Jewish people, the Palestinian people, the Rohingya people, the Uyghurs, the Kurds, whoever we want to talk about, the Haitians, you know, everything that's going on in the world today, Hazaras. So I, I, while I completely agree with you that that forms part of our responsibility, I also try, I'm trying to make this slightly broader claim that we also always already have this responsibility because we simply share the earth with people we didn't choose and that mm. we have a moral duty to safeguard human plurality as such. 
um, yeah, and hence this sort of exorbitant logic of resisting resisting the sort of past, the the sort of the rhetoric around numbers and, and, and rabbits and 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 yeah, this type of, of rhetoric. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I I think we're we're all fairly much in, in in agreement with each other. We we might quibble about um um you know uh, um I, I aspects of this, but I th I think the broad theme um I'd I'd like to think that we have consensus. And and you're right, the it's the nickel and diming um, of governments around the world of going, oh, we can only do so much. You know, that is such a cop out. Yeah. You know, and we've seen it not just in terms of refugees, we've seen it in terms of COVID where, you know, billions of money, uh, uh, you know, billions of dollars was, um, you know, given to the business community in JobKeeper, but we can't possibly, uh, you know, the, the argument coming out of the government now is that we cannot possibly keep, um, you know, giving people uh, support during lockdowns and things because, you know, it's just not economical. And it's like, well, those are people's lives you're affecting. Right. You know, so... I, I, so I think it, 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 it's, you know, the, the lens that you've put on this in terms of refugees, I think is incredibly powerful, and incre incredibly important. But I think also you've raised a great point in the fact that the, this whole, you know, responsibility to humans in general, you know, it's woven through every aspect of our society, you know, in terms of, of um, the social contract and, and, and welfare and, you know, giving people a dignified life and a living wage and all that sort of thing. And it, it, it's all in, right. interconnected. I agree. And I think like COVID, for example, shows that. I mean, you know, if I can invoke my father for a moment, who is a trained theologian, you know, the kind of things I've learned from him. Uh, David Bell, if you're listening in there, um, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I learned from dad about things like, you know, Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, where King has this great phrase about what he calls that our inescapable network of mutuality. That, that we human beings sort of need each other, depend upon each other and impact each other, which we see very clearly with with COVID, with climate change and with these other things. So that we have to have a sort of a, a set of arrangements in this world where we take care of each other. It's sort of it's almost like Sesame Street logic. It's just this sort of basic elementary um, level of care. But 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 one which which you know continues to fail to inform the politics of most states in the world. You know, I have a long section in the book about that the death of children does not barely raises an eyebrow and, and I have this whole concatenation of examples from you know Alan Curdy everyone knows the child who drowned on the beach in Turkey but this is going on everywhere all the time you know there's a, there was a two-year-old child who was denied a birthday cake in detention in Australia a couple of years ago people may remember this the, the, I mean it's sort of like, like I call it a political moloch it's like it's politics as infanticide as the, as the killing of children or, or the or the or the destruction of children yeah, so we're not even we're not even at a minimally decent politics yet. So 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 I suppose that's why my book has a certain sort of ardent tone. Like it's like, come on, for God's sake, like why aren't we there yet? Yeah, I mean, as I say, like you know, the the cruelty is the point in so many right. of our um of of our country's policy positions, um, whether it be you know refugees or job seeker or anything else. It's yeah, and I don't think that's why that we, you know, we as a party and, and we as party members um, are, you know, striving for that better future for everyone. It's wonderful to, as I said at the start, it's wonderful to see the Democrats, you know, taking this issue so seriously. I mean, I think you could, you know, if you push this, you could maybe steal some votes from the Greens, <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe get to the left of the Greens on refugee policy. That would be amazing. Yeah, well, I, I will put a link to our refugee policy um, in the meeting notes and, and I'll see if Christian can send that out in his follow up emails. Um, because it, um, and again, all respect to Nathan and um, it, it's been a fascinating and, and you know, inspiring talk from you. Um, but we do have to stress that you are a guest to the Australian Democrats and your book does not reflect our, our current refugee policy position. I think a lot of the themes and along a lot of the positions are probably um, part of the same Venn diagram, but um, um, just like to, um, you know, whole separation of church and state thing just like yeah, to, to no support it. No yeah. But um, Nathan, thank you so much for this. And, and apologies again for the technical issues you were having earlier. Um, we will do a review on that and, and see if we can come up with a better format no, for the I future. My, like, I really apologise. I think it's my internet. But yeah, um, thank you for oh. bearing with me over the phone. But um, I, I really enjoyed it. Awesome. Now, before we wrap up, does anyone have any other last sort of questions or comments they want to make before we um, we end tonight and give you your evenings back? 
Uh, well, first of all, I thought that was a great talk, Nathan, and I, I really enjoyed it. And I can see from the comments in the meeting chat that other people uh, did too. But I'd like to reflect upon the fact that obviously I've known Nathan for, you know, 40 plus years. Um, but when I'm I... Tell them how old I am. <laughs> I'm not telling them exactly <laughs> yeah. how old you are. But when I read his book, even I learned... Uh, a perspective in in ethical moral thinking that that I'd never thought about. Nathan's right that I I am highly trained in theology. Uh, I do have a, a, a religious perspective on a whole lot of things, uh, not least being love thy neighbour. Um, but but Nathan's book was a revelation to his father, not only about how 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 good you know, the reasoning was, but it opened up new moral horizons for me, and, and I thank you for that, my son. Thank you, thank you, Dad. That's very generous of you. Um, yeah, as I say, uh, you know, I learned much of it from you, from your, your political counsel over the years and moral counsel. Um, but, yeah, but thank you for those um, kind comments. Um, again, thank you. On behalf of the Australian Democrats, thank you, um, firstly, Nathan, for um, his fascinating and, and uh, uh, wide-ranging talk tonight. Thank you for David for bringing us, Nathan, both in, in more senses um, than one, uh, in that you are also Nathan's father. Um, and thank you, uh, Julia and Sujay, for your really insightful and challenging and interesting comments. And we really appreciate yeah, your you. your participation tonight. It's, it, you really have made the, um, the the chat that much more um you know, interesting and thought provoking and, and I can't thank you enough for that. And all of our other guests, thank you again so much for coming along. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Alana, and thank you, Christian. Thank you, Dad, and thank you for everyone who attended. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you again to Dr. Nathan Bell for sharing his book and his message with us. I've put a link to it in the show notes if you'd like to read some more. I've also added a link to our position on an amnesty for asylum seekers and some articles on the fall of Afghanistan and the government's failures in the withdrawal from that war. The Democrats were still in Parliament when the governments of the day committed to the wars in Iraq, both of them, and the war in Afghanistan. And we opposed Australian involvement in all three of these conflicts. Watching the fall of Kabul last year only underlined that our senators at the time, party president Lynn Allison among them, were tragically proven correct in their opposition. Steve and I will be back soon with some more episodes for you. If you enjoy the podcast and you want to support its production, you can donate to us at our website, democrats.org.au, and I've put a link in the show notes. Steve and I volunteer our time to every aspect of our involvement with the Democrats, but there are costs in hosting and producing the podcast. If you'd like to toss a coin or two our way to help out, it's very much appreciated. Keep the Bastards Honest is brought to you by the Australian Democrats. This episode was edited and produced by me, Alana Mitchell. If you'd like to keep in touch, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and LinkedIn by searching for Australian Democrats and you can see what we stand for, what we value and what our policy positions are at our website at democrats.org.au. Until next time, thanks for listening.